At least 3,000 people have been forced to flee the Janine refugee camp after Israel launched its most intense military operation in the occupied West Bank in nearly 20 years. What does the Israeli state hope to gain from the present onslaught? It was another birthday marked in jail for WikiLeaks founder and whistleblower Julian Assange, who has been in the highest security Belmarsh prison in the United Kingdom, awaiting a verdict in a long-running extradition case from the United States where he's charged under the Espionage Act. This is, of course, an open declaration of what the West really thinks of the freedom of the press. What is the status of his legal fight against the system? And why do many liberal commentators feel time is not on his side? And the United Nations' nuclear watchdog is set to give its backing to Japan's plan to release millions of tons of treated radioactive water from the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima power plant into the Pacific Ocean. Why is the dumping so controversial? You're watching Daily Debrief coming to you from the People's uh, Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi uh, with me, Sidhan Dani. And first up, we're talking about Palestine, where Israel has vowed to press on with military operations, including, of course, drone strikes, aircraft, and an open-ended uh, mission involving hundreds of troops on the ground in the occupied town of Jenin on the Palestinian West Bank. At least 10 people have been killed and over 100 injured, some of them critically Thousands, uh, perhaps those who have the means, have already fled the refugee camp, which is otherwise home to 18,000 displaced people. Uh, Abdul Rahman is with us uh, to talk more about the situation on the ground in Palestine and also what this escalation sort of indicates in the larger picture. Uh, Abdul, uh, thanks again, uh, as always, for joining us on Daily Debrief. Uh, first up, what, what are you hearing? What is the latest? Uh, yeah, and then we take it from there. Well, uh, it seems that what happened yesterday, after that, Palestinians have kind of taken it uh, and organized a large number of demonstrations all across the occupied West Bank. Today, uh, there was a national strike in the West Bank, which was observed, uh, which is being observed. And uh, also, uh, those demonstrations are no more. If you if you look if if you are following Palestine, you will know that for a very long time it was basically demonstrations which tried to uh, 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 kind of uh, fall in uh, in the larger category of peaceful demonstrations. Mm. They are basically calling for resistance mm. against the repeated Israeli assaults, uh, 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 and which is becoming greater and greater every day. So uh, there are open calls for armed resistance against the Israeli occupation and at different places. In whatever form possible, Palestinians have started resisting it. Uh, there were reports about, uh, at some places, Palestinians uh, throwing crackers on the Israeli soldiers in East Jerusalem. Then there were a small uh, uh, attempts to kind of resist uh, uh, Israeli soldiers in different other smaller towns across the West Bank. That is one thing which is happening. Again, Hamas, um, Islamic Jihad. Uh, Al-Aqsa Brigade of the Fatah movement, all mm. of them have given calls for resistance uh, if the uh, assault does not uh, stop uh, immediately. Uh, though this is from the Palestinian side of it, uh, despite, uh, along with the fact that there is a widespread condemnation coming from across the world, the mere words which, is, which have been repeated so often that now yeah, it has, they have lost time. their meaning. But one thing which is uh, uh, noticeable is that the Palestinians, particularly on the ground, have basically decided, it seems that this uh, kind of repeated uh, appeals for calm and peace is meaningless and they need to resist the Israeli onslaught as uh, fiercely as possible. And that is exactly what is unfolding on the ground. Uh, 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 the, the on the Israeli side of it, uh, just to kind of add it, yeah, add it yeah. instead of instead of seizing the operations, given the fact that there is a widespread condemnation and so on and so forth, Israeli uh, general was on record, uh, uh, reported by Times of Israel, saying mm. that this is not an one-off operation and uh, as we were there a few weeks back, we will be there again in the coming days. So this is not the one and uh, only operation which uh, is happening in Zenin. And of, as they say, this is uh, uh, there are attempt to control the quote unquote terrorist movement inside the uh, uh, palace, occupied Palestine. Mm. But uh, of course, that is how they define the resistance movement in the occupied territories, which yeah. 
it seems, given all the indications on the ground, is increasing day by day. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Janine is, of course, uh, like like you were pointing out, Abdul, uh, a sort of uh, hub in that sense uh, for the resistance against the occupation uh, and the escalation that we are seeing, or the in in or the wave, new wave of resistance that we are seeing is in response to uh, also escalations from the Israeli side uh, where, you know, there's been a sort of multi-pronged uh, attack on the rights of Palestinians uh, over a sustained period. So, uh, connect the dots for us, uh, if you will. See, if you just see the record, uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, Janin has been attacked several times uh, by the Israeli occupation forces and scores of people have died, including 10 this time. Um, the, I, the fact that Israeli forces are taking this uh, repeated uh, raids and attacks on Janin, on other places inside the occupied uh, uh, West Bank, uh, they have been kind of uh, uh, on the offensive uh, on a very regular basis inside the occupied territories mm. shows that there is a very strong uh, increase in the resistance of the Palestinians to the occupation. And this basically should be seen in the larger context of the changes in the global politics, changes in the Israeli politics as well, mm -hmm. and also some kind of uh, resentment against the, the beaten path which the Palestinian uh, Authority has taken vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. -vis, uh, the uh, right to self-determination movement in Palestine. It mm. seems that the large number of young population in Palestine, uh, in the occupied territories, sees those uh, methods uh, uh, useless, finds them uh, uh, non-productive, finds them uh, harmful for their basic uh, dignity, uh, their right to life, and their right to self-determination. Mm. All of this, and and that is the reason that in last two three years at least, as the Israeli politics shifts towards the right extreme right, which basically believes in the idea that there is no Palestine and uh, uh, do, does everything, which basically leads to uh, 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 me, uh, becoming the whole idea of a, a, a separate Palestinian state meaningless in, mm. uh, in West Bank and in occupied East Jerusalem mm. and in Gaza. Given that context, given the understanding that the uh, the current political scenario, both at the global level and in Israeli politics, is completely against the established uh, demands of Palestinian self-determination. A majority of the Palestinian youth think that this uh, the conventional understanding is no more working, and there is a time, right time. This is the right time to basically take the resistance to another level, and mm. that is what we have seen since in the last, at least last couple of. Uh, years and in particular it, uh, since the beginning of this year that mm. there has been a growing resistance and uh, so the Israeli uh, attempts to kind of curb that resistance also increases both in scale, scale and uh, uh, in its uh, uh, brutality on mm. the ground. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Abdul, for for like putting it in in those very uh, clearly understandable terms. Also, uh, and we'll uh, catch up with you very soon. I'm sure on Daily DP for an update. A British court last week denied WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange permission to appeal an order to extradite him to the United States, where he faces criminal charges under the Espionage Act. Although Assange's legal team, of course, will continue to explore all the options they have, uh, it seems like the noose around his neck is clearly tightening. And time is also not on his side. Uh, Anish, uh, in the meantime, it's another prison uh, birthday for Julian Assange. Uh, give us an update first on uh, where mat matters are in the legal sense of things, where the appeal is concerned, where the extradition process is concerned as well. Yes, yeah, so uh, the legal process itself, uh, Assange is basically uh, uh, facing the last appeal uh, that he can actually possibly uh, go for in the current process. And uh, if this appeal fails, he's pretty much uh, set for extradition. And that is like a uh, road clear for the United States to extradite him and try him uh, at a uh, before a federal jury in the US. Now, the issue is such that, and I think the emergency is such that, uh, that there is a significant risk 
uh, not just of extradition, but also the fact that there could be harm, bodily harm to him uh, through this extradition, uh, not necessarily, uh, not just because of uh, what uh, the defense team was talking about, which is uh, a, a debilitating uh, mental health problem that uh, Assange is facing under, under prison conditions right now within Balmash. Uh, it is also the fact that the prison conditions in the U.S. is going to be a lot more worse, uh, considering how uh, the record itself, a public record that exists on uh, high security prisons, especially for political prisoners in the U.S. And mm. on top of that, Assange is also a suicide risk. So there is significant uh, danger or uh, dangers that actually, and um, we are talking about immediate bodily harm. Uh, posed on Assange just because of an extradition right now. And so being so close to something that can be so uh, dangerous for him is actually alarming a lot more people than it used to before because a lot more people actually believe that the British courts uh, at the very least would have some level of protections and would probably consider the fact that he is a political prisoner at the end of the day, that he is a publisher and that there is there are no grounds to actually prosecute him under mm. the uh, the uh, not not the official but the espionage, but mm. uh, yeah, exactly, and uh, but that is what uh, the Biden administration is pursuing at the moment, which is obviously continued from the Trump administration era pros- prosecution, but uh, and the British courts have uh, been taken over by some diplomatic assurances uh, that they have given after the first uh, verdict was given, which actually cancelled and rejected the execution itself. So we are looking at a system that is act- actively making way for uh, the execution rather than actually uh, looking for checks and balances because we are not what it's supposed to. Appeals be- exactly. The appeals processes are also, have also not gone through any kind of rigorous uh, trial at the, ever since the High Court, uh, the, the High Court Justice in London uh, mm-hmm. ruled against the magistrate's court's decision to reject the execution. So we are seeing what we are seeing is like the even none of the new evidence uh, of published reports of uh, statements by prime witnesses that they have forged uh, their testimony. None of that has been considered very seriously in the uh, British court. Uh, more it is only these diplomatic assurances that the U.S. ambassador gave to the British government that has been taken uh, at face value for this execution to go forward. Uh, and Anish, there are um, literally hundreds of elected representatives who uh, stand for democracy, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech and expression uh, in his home country, Australia, in the United Kingdom, elsewhere in Europe and the Western world. Uh, what does the, the sort of startling uh, lack of opposition to this entire process, uh, at least in terms of like mainstream public discourse, uh, tell us about the, what the uh, Western establishment actually thinks of all these terms and, and, and concepts. Well, the hypocrisy is uh, laid bare with this entire trial. Uh, we have seen how, uh, and there have been instances where there were deaths of uh, whistleblowers in maximum security prison in the US after being extradited. Uh, extradited from you know those alliance partner countries or you know, friendly countries, uh, mm. uh, but none of that has been taken into consideration. We have seen a very narrowed down uh, uh, kind of trial where you know the scope of uh, evidence that can be presented by the defense uh, was also uh, quite small. So apart from the courts, we have also seen a certain level of. Uh, uh, not silence per se, but an endorsement, uh, in fact, by certain people within the government. The Tories, obviously, the Conservative government in the UK have been there ever since Assange was on trial. No matter who the Prime Minister was, uh, mm-hmm. we've seen uh, several of them uh, changing yeah. seats in, in this uh, musical chair. But nevertheless, uh, every single one of them have endorsed the extradition. Every single one of them, before he became the Prime Minister, and those uh, and those this notion that Assange is somehow uh, more criminally liable for exposing war crimes than the actual uh, perpetrators of the war crimes to begin with. And uh, the Biden administration has talked about, kept, uh, has always kept talking about the due process of like letting the due process move forward, 
but uh, very conveniently hides the fact that it is a political prosecution. It is made by a political appointee, an appointee that uh, who is there simply because the president wishes it. So, and not, and not because of uh, you know any kind of merit or qualification or any kind of administrative uh, mechanisms. Uh, mm -hmm. It is simply because the president appointed that person. So uh, the prosecutor general, or for that matter, uh, any of the federal prosecutors for that matter, are appointed by the president. They do not exist without a political uh, affiliation or alliance with the president or the ruling establishment. So the whole system, the whole case itself is a politically motivated case. And that is something that is also quite uh, very well hidden in many of the press uh, itself. But we also have to give credit to whatever opposition that does exist. We have seen some uh, lawmakers in the US and Britain calling out the, uh, on the, not just the prosecution, uh, but also the uh, continued incarceration of Assange in a prison uh, condition where he's pretty much locked away from the world. He doesn't have access to his lawyers or his families, he does not get to uh, call them as often as he should. Uh, in uh, many cases, even during the trial, we've seen that more than 20 hours of his uh, time a day uh, goes in complete isolation inside the prison, which, show, which is actually something that even for people who do not uh, have any kind of pre-existing mental health conditions would actually give them some uh, level of you know, uh, uh, deteriorating uh, mental health problems uh, uh, in the long run. So this is the fifth birthday that he is uh, observing inside this prison, in, in this prison condition. And there have been calls for, at least from the Australian establishment, as, as, uh, currently we have seen the Australian government talking, uh, trying to make diplomatic maneuvers to get him back home, very clearly saying that they want Assange back and they do not want him to be extradited. So even that uh, fact that there is the Australian establishment right now calling for his return, it itself shows how significant and how popular it is uh, for uh, to have him released, but the very fact that this is being ignored mm. by the British and the US establishment shows that there is a complicity and even an endorsement of this continued incarceration. Right, Anish, thanks for that update. Stick with us. We'll be back with you in a minute because we're talking about Fukushima and uh, the International Atomic Agency's backing of Japan's plan uh, to release 1.3 million cubic meters of wastewater that has uh, accumulated since 2011 at the site of the uh, Fukushima nuclear uh, disaster. Uh, the plan has of course drawn fierce criticism from Japan's neighbours in the Pacific, not the least on grounds that they were not even consulted. But the UN agency is backing the plans anyway. Uh, Anish, uh, we'll come back to you now. What uh, is the IAEA's stand on this matter and uh, does it make sense? Well, uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, we have to consider uh, the data that they have given is quite rigorous. It is a two-year-long study, and it actually clearly shows that uh, there is a significant, uh, significantly lowered risk of uh, releasing uh, these waters, which, are, which basically have uh, tritium and uh, carbon-12. Now, both of these are uh, not highly uh, radioactive, uh, tritium is basically just a radioactive version of hydrogen, and so they are considered to be beta emitters, and they do not pose this sort of risk that, uh, that say, other kind of radioactive material would have uh, carried. But the concerns uh, regarding these, uh, uh, you know, emissions of, you know, the release of such wastewater. Uh, into the ocean would be a the fact that there will be uh, an accumulation, a bioaccumulation of salt uh, over years or maybe even decades, and it can have long-term impact. A uh, secondly, the fact that there is a complete lack of consulting uh, between the nations uh, on how uh, the effects and how these waters will be released to begin with, and the level of uh, the number, the level of these waste waters to be released into the ocean. And mm -hmm. finally, the likelihood of all the fisher, uh, fisher folk who live in the region, not just in Japan, but also in the area, because a lot of them, and not just fisher folk, but also pretty much any kind of industry that uh, depends on the ocean, uh, which uh, apart from uh, you know fishing also includes you know, the salt making industry. Mm -hmm. All of them, uh, we are already seeing uh, reports of how Koreans are uh, you know, stocking up on salt, sea salt, because of the, their concerns over the ocean water. 
Now, the now these issues are obviously being addressed in the report itself. What they're looking at is how safe it is. That is pretty much, it is a very narrow set of study that has been conducted, and it only looks at how safe these water will be. It does not consider not just the political and social implication, but also maybe, you know, a very long-term impact of these uh, pollution into the ocean in uh, a, very, a longer span of time, rather than just, say, a couple of years later. Right. Uh, Anish, we are also, I think, struggling a little bit the quality of your audio on the show today. So, just, just very briefly, if you can uh, sum up for us what the kind of political uh, response has been uh, and, and give us a sense of how a UN agency can come to uh, an understanding on a plan that has not been discussed really, like you were saying, at a multilateral level. Yeah, so the idea is basically for Japan, it was always to show and portray and, you know, insist on the fact that it, these uh, wastewater release would be uh, safe. And that is pretty much it. That's what uh, the IA report actually talks about. And that's the only thing that they talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time, uh, there are other political implications to it. And not just political, we are talking about social and economic implications yeah. that will not be discussed as much. And that is the key issue here. And it is not something that is only being raised by, say, countries uh, like China, who are seen as, you know, uh, uh, an adversary to, the, to Japan in geopolitical terms, but also friendly countries like South Korea, uh, even though the South Korean government has taken a pro-release stand at this point in time and is trying to convince its uh, population mm -hmm. through meetings and everything. Uh, but there are also other friendly nations in the Pacific who are very much concerned about the release of these waters. And, the, and we are not even talking about a plethora of scientific, uh, within the scientific community who have also opposed uh, such you know, arbitrary release of waters without consultations and without, without full transparency of the entire plan. We do not know how much of it is going to be released at once, if there is going to be a set of plan on how uh, if there is going to be a schedule. Because mm -hmm. all of these matter when you talk about concentration and radioactivity. And yeah. none of these are being uh, divulged at the moment by the Japanese government. It's essentially acting more or less unilaterally at the point. And that is the key issue here at the moment. All right. Thanks very much for that update, Anish. Uh, we'll, I think, uh, catch you again. And it's good to see you after a while uh, on the show as well. Hope you're doing well. Uh, and with that, we bring to a close, of course, this episode of Daily Debrief. Uh, as always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for updates on these stories and all of the other work we do. Uh, don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice if you haven't already. We'll be back, same time, same place, tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.